Good evening, I'm Paul Golter. I'm your instructor for Lab 1102. I thought I would start this first session with a little bit about myself. Um, my background is in chemical engineering. Um, I have a bachelor's and master's in chemical engineering and a PhD in engineering science. Um, I grew up in Oregon and Washington, that area, and spent four years as a process engineer in pulp and paper industry. Uh, during that time, in my department, we were the backup people for the environmental and safety department, which you know consisted of one person each. Um, and we were also responsible for any and all non-routine testing that happened. Uh, we were in the lab, and um, our department as a whole was responsible for the, uh, the final product quality testing and, and such. Um, so I've got some industrial lab experience that is somewhat applicable. Um, I also spent 10 years as the instructional laboratory supervisor in chemical engineering at Washington State University, um, which meant I was in charge of the undergraduate lab equipment, um, any upgrades and maintenance for that, uh, helping students learn how to use that, and uh, oh, also everything computer. Um, I moved to Ohio a couple years ago to teach at OU. Um, I do have uh, three kids, three dogs, three cats, and two bunnies. Uh, you may sometimes hear the dogs and kids in the background here. Um, currently, I am doing uh, some IT work and um, editing technical papers for non-English non speakers um, and teaching this course. Uh, which is part of why this course is scheduled late at night like it is right now. All right, um, let's move on into talking about lab safety. Um, ordinarily, at this point, I would start with a tour of the lab and a discussion of what safety features were, where to find the uh, eye wash fountains and lab shower, where the fire extinguisher is, where the fire alarms are, what the best escape routes are, where we would meet if there was an emergency and we had to evacuate the building, um, things like that. Uh, but we don't have that option at the moment. Um, things being as they are, we are uh, hopefully we can hopefully we can get through this um, online and uh, be able to fit the hands-on portion in at the end of the semester. Um, because this class will be a lot more useful to you if you get to practice actually doing some stuff in the lab. In the meantime, we can, we can talk about lab safety. We can talk about how to do various types of analyses. Um, I will try to go out and find some good videos on, on general lab technique and and how to use some equipment and, and get that posted. Um, try to make sure that, that this is as useful as we can make it. Um, all right, back, back to laboratory safety. Um, I have attached a couple of PowerPoints to the week one, day one folder in Blackboard, uh, one of which is a, a Ramp RAMP presentation that uh, Fred Clausen came up with. Um, Ramp is an acronym in safety. It stands for recognizing hazards, assess risk, minimize risks, and prepare for emergencies. Um, the presentation, and I honestly don't have a lot of details on the situation outside of what's in the presentation. Um, essentially, Sometime, I assume last year, a delivery the UPS guy, uh, FedEx, I, I'm not sure what, um, came to the loading dock there at Hawking College um, with a load of chemicals. So he was carrying a box of concentrated sulfuric acid. If you're not familiar with the, the way concentrated acids are shipped from you know, Fisher or VWR, they come in 
four liter glass jars. They're usually lined with um, plastic on the outside. They, they feel almost rubbery. Um, so they're a little bit tacky and hard to drop. Um, they also hold together fairly well. They're, they're fairly thick and durable um, bit of glass. Um, but they're four liter jugs. They're usually four to a box. Um, so he was carrying this in and the box had gotten wet at some point and fell apart and the jugs dropped and at least one of them broke and made a concentrated acid mess all over the floor. Um, concentrated sulfuric acid can be some relatively nasty stuff. Um, it's honestly slightly nastier if it's just a little bit diluted. So concentrated sulfuric acid is typically 98 or 95%. If it drops down, um, if I'm remembering right, you can pump 98% sulfuric acid through a black iron pipe and it will not corrode the pipe. If it drops down to like 90 or 92%, it will eat the pipe for breakfast and, you know, come back for more. Um, so it's kind of interesting that way. Um, so uh, what I would like you to do for the discussion on this first day, um, I should mention how I'm doing attendance. I'll, I'll set take this time to, to mention that. Um, since Hawking College does require attendance, um, and that's a little bit harder to do right now, I, I guess I could look and see who's in the, the session and, and do that, but I, I thought it'd be more useful to uh, get the attendance and participation done using the uh, discussion boards built into Blackboard. So if you get a discussion post done by the end of class, um, the end of this class session on, on the topic, um, in this case, on the ramp presentation. I've, I've got the prompts there in the, the discussion board. Get that up by the, uh, by the end of this class. Um, you'll get credit for um, that. That's your attendance. If you then, if you do that and go in and give a a comment on somebody else's post, um, something you know a little more than just yes i agree no that's that's wrong um you know something something a little bit more meaningful that that will get you the participation points as well um you do get five points for participating in each class with the exception of the final i believe I don't think you get participation points for the final. I'd have to double check that. I, I think that's how I set it up. Um, I am trying to make this a little bit more flexible, uh, hence the recorded lecture. I would prefer to use the uh, the live meeting time more as a question and answer session. And so I, I would expect you've done the reading and looked at these lectures ahead of time. I will do my best to try to get these up um, ahead of time so that you can view them before the class session Monday and Thursday evening. Um, okay, so back to the, uh, the, the acid spill at the loading dock. Um, luckily, they, there was a plan in place. Uh, the people who were there had cleanup procedures. No one was injured. Um, the correct equipment was there to to wash the acid off with and uh, clean up the spill. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to deal with chemical spills in a, in a few minutes. Um, so it, the, the safety procedures they had in place worked. Um, and they were able to use it to talk about what they could do differently to make sure something like that didn't happen again. That is an important part of, of safety programs in an, in an industrial scale. Um, when I was at the, the pulp mill, um, we were up for sale most of the time I was there. And one of the things we did 
work really hard on was was being very sure we had a good safety culture at the plant during the sale process. Um, nobody wants to be a statistic. Uh, everybody wants to be able to go home and do the same things they were able to enjoy before they went to, to work that morning. Um, and that's generally what the safety programs are aimed at, at making sure happen. Um, a lot of them are aimed at the idea that if there's a fatality, there's some number, it, 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 it's a pyramid. If there's a fatality, there's some larger number of serious accidents, some larger than that number of less serious accidents, some larger number than that of even less serious accidents, and some very large number of near misses. Um, things that could have been an accident, but luckily enough, they weren't. So your serious safety programs will generally start focusing on those near misses. If you're aware of those and you're reporting those and you're trying to figure out how those happen so that you can avoid those in the future, you make that fatality so much less likely to happen. Um, so it, it turns into a lot of attention to, not, not, not even attention to detail, just awareness of what you're doing. Um, I filled out some for, you know, I was trying to do too many things at once in different sides of the lab and running back and forth between and slipped on the floor and, and fell, um, wasn't injured, but you know, it was a near miss. I could have fallen wrong and, and cracked my head open. It was a cement floor. Um, so that, that is what a lot of, um, safety programs are aimed at. They, they want to reduce the likelihood of something serious happening by paying attention to the things that aren't serious. Okay. All right, I'm going to... All right, let's move on to material safety data sheets. Um, these are Usually they're a, a fairly good sized packet of information that you get from the manufacturer. The manufacturer is legally obliged to make these available and provide them to you. Um, most industries and businesses are required to have them on site. Um, you have to have them on hand. You have to have them for your employees to reference. You have to have them so you know what to do. Um, they are specific to a concentration or form of chemical. Uh, for example, 95% ethanol has a different MSDS than 5% ethanol. Um, sodium hydroxide pellets have a different MSDS than sodium hydroxide solution. Um, deionized water has an MSDS. It's different than the distilled water MSDS. Um, because a lot of the information on that is unique to the specific chemical. Um, I've include, uploaded some uh, sample MSDSs to Blackboard, um, one for ethanol and one for water. Um, I'll go over those a little bit in the uh, actual class session tomorrow. Um, I'm recording this Sunday evening. Uh, the MSDSs have uh, consistent sections between each uh, each form. So you can find the same type of information in the same place no matter what the MSDS is for or for no matter who made it. Um, so it starts with section one um, and you, they usually have big section headers so you can tell where you are. You've got section one that gives the identification, the name of the, uh, the compound, any other names it tends to go by, you know, for example, um, sodium hydroxide is sometimes used to be known as caustic soda. Um, and soda ash is something different. Um, you have sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate. One or the other of those sometimes went by sodium hydrogen carbonate, and I've forgotten which. Um, when you get into the old timey chemical names, they they can get a little screwy like that, and I, I don't remember what all of them are. 
Um, also have bicarbonate of soda is one of those. Um, but uh, who the supplier was, um, if they've got a a number or code they go with, uh, you know, CAS number something or other, um, and the emergency phone number for the manufacturer. So in an emergency, call this number and they'll help you figure out what to do. Um, section two, you have the hazard identification that gives you the classification information, uh, label elements, the toxicity, precautions. It's kind of an overview of those. Um, section three is the composition. Uh, you can have pure substance or you can have a mixture. I believe the, uh, the ethanol I uploaded was 95% ethanol. I believe it was denatured. So you should note that it's got some methanol and I believe isopropanol in it as well, making it not safe to drink. Um, so the information on uh, you know what's in it and how much of each compound is in it is, is contained in there. Section four is your first aid section. Um, what are the treatments you need to do? Um, what are the symptoms of exposure? Um, does the treatment need to be immediate or can you can it wait a little bit? Uh, in the ethanol one, I noticed there was a section on advice to the physician. Um, Usually there's a, a long-term exposure and a short-term, you know, acute and chronic exposure. Uh, acute for short-term, chronic for long-term um, treatment and, and symptoms. Uh, section 5 is the firefighting information. What to use if it catches fire. Um, does it have any special hazards involved with fire and heat? Um, general firefighting fighting instructions. Section six is the accidental release measures. What to do if it spills? Um, what personal precautions do you need to take? What environmental precautions do you need to take? Um, you know, does it say in, in, you know, avoid letting it contact uh, vegetation, avoid letting it get into the streams? Uh, general instructions. Uh, might include what you can use to absorb a spill. Um, sometimes they keep these a little bit general to avoid getting sued for telling you the wrong thing. Um, but there's also a lot of good information in these. Um, with a little bit of knowledge, you can, you can know what to do. Uh, section seven is handling and storage. So again, you've got you know what to do to handle it safely and what it is safe to store with and what it's not safe to store with. Um, I did note in the uh, lab room there in, in Hawking College, they have, uh, you know, you've got, there's a big acid cabinet against the wall with the windows and on the, uh, on the wall to the right hand side of that, there's a little flammables cabinet. So if you open the flammables cabinet, that's usually organic chemicals that are flammable. Um, for some reason, the uh, hydrogen peroxide is, is stored in there. Um, another thing I learned at the pulp mill is that concentrated hydrogen peroxide is some very dangerous stuff. Uh, we had it on site because we did non-chlorine bleaching. Um, so we used uh, hydrogen peroxide for that. I long since forgotten what percentage we applied it at. I believe we stored it at 70%. It was shipped to us at 90%. We had to watch safety videos about how to safely have hydrogen peroxide around. Um, and in one of them, they poured some 90% hydrogen peroxide over a leather boot and it caught fire. Um, the reaction between the hydrogen peroxide and the leather boot was enough to cause visible flames. Um, it is not something I would choose to put in the flammables cabinet. Um, and information on what you can and cannot safely store this chemical with um, is on the MSDS. Uh, you know, you don't want to store acids and bases. You don't want to store acids with flammables. Um, there are lots of things like that. Um, 
there are types of powders you don't want to store together too. Um, that that's uh, but that information is there on the MSDS. Uh, section eight is exposure control. So you've got your regulatory limits um, and the controls. So you've got the uh, short-term weighted average, um, I believe, is one of the ones OSHA uses, and uh, time-weighted average. Um, you know, you're not allowed to be exposed to more than this concentration over this period of time. <clears throat> All right, section nine is the properties. So things like the molecular weight, the boiling point, uh, the flash points, you know, where it's gonna, what temperature is likely to catch fire at, uh, the explosion limits. Um, you know, we all know that oxygen is flammable. Um, if there's too much oxygen, it is, it will, well, oxygen within a certain range is not just flammable, it can cause an explosion. If you get below that range, there's not enough oxygen there to, to cause a problem. If you get above that range, um, I've honestly forgotten the reasoning for, for why it's outside the exposure limit. Um, and it might not, oxygen might not have an upper explosion limit for explosive limit. I'd have to check. With a lot of things, if you get above that range, there's not enough oxygen around to, to then explode. Um, oxygen might not have one. I, I would have to check. I should, I should double check that. Um, but, but that's a, a side point. Um, section 10 is reactivity. So what it will react with, what it is incompatible with. Um, you may notice that some of this seems like it's prob possibly duplicate information from what you might see in storage. Um, and I, I'm sure there's some overlap, but it, it's also additional information. It also, in this section, would include hazardous decomposition products if it, if it has them. Uh, for example, um, is it dichlorosilane? Um, it's a chemical that gets used in uh, in the silicon industry in etching and, and growing silicon crystals. Um, if you mix it with water, it will generate hydrochloric acid vapor, and that's a you know becomes a hazardous decomposition product. Um, no, sorry. It's been a couple years. Um, it generates chlorine gas and um, hydrochloric acid in the liquid. Um, it may heat up enough to generate to, to vaporize the acid as well. I, I can't remember for sure. Um, but things like that would be there in that in section 10 of the MSDS. Uh, section 11, we get to the toxicological information. So you have the uh, LD50, LD50, LC50, sorry. Um, LD50 is lethal dose that will kill 50% of a population. So you'll see uh, LD50 rats. So at that dose of that chemical, it killed 50% of a rat population when tested. Um, LC50 is, you know, when you exposed whatever population to that particular concentration of chemical, it killed 50% of them. Um, that information is there in section 11. It, it gives you a, an estimate of, of how nasty it is. You know, you don't see a, an LD50 human, um, at least I've, I've never heard of one. So they, it's, it's usually an animal and they try to, it, based on that, interpret how humans would respond. Um, Section 12 is ecological info. So you've got things like what the risk is to fish if it gets into a stream, what the risk is to insect life if, if it's ex, um, released, uh, things like that. How, how nasty is this going to be in the environment? OK, last few sections. Section 13 is the waste disposal. Uh, section 14 is your transport. So that's where you're going to find the uh, if you've driven behind the tanker truck, you know, you've got that di diamond label. Um, what needs to be on those labels would be here in section 14. Um, 
Section 15 or any regulations that apply to it. Um, there are EPA regulations for reporting that re apply to different chemicals. Um, that information would be here, um, which, which ones it applies to. Um, and then finally, you've got section 16, which is other. So, you know, anything that didn't really fit, this section does include the NFPA labels. Again, that's a diamond label. It's got four other little diamonds on it. Um, don't have one in front of me, so I'm trying to go off memory. You've got flammability, reactivity, um, special hazards, and health hazards. Um, the thing to know about the NFPA labels is these are for the National Fire Protection Association. So these are how this chemical responds in an emergency. More specifically in a fire emergency, but in an emergency. So it's aimed at what the firefighter needs to know as he's approaching storage for this. Um, and to some extent, it it may be a little elevated because it is for an emergency situation, not for necessarily routine storage, but you can still get a feel for how safe or dangerous a chemical is based on those. Um, anything else for hazard ratings and such are, are there in section 16. Um, let's talk a little bit about waste disposal. There are Compatible and incompatible waste, just like there are compatible and incompatible things to store. Uh, generally, you have a separate container for acid wastes and organic wastes. Sometimes there's a container for base as well. Um, you don't want to mix your wastes. Um, I knew a graduate student uh, who, I, I'm not sure what he did or what which one, what he put in the wrong one, but he some of his waste in the wrong thing and, and blew up his fume hood. Um, it, it can happen, it, but it's not a safe thing to do. And it can cause, um, you know, in this case, it, was, it, it didn't cause a big problem. I've heard stories about, um, about you know, fire starting and uh, explosions being large enough to cause injuries. Um, that this, in this instance, it was a fairly small explosion, but it still, um, still created a hazard. Um, you also have things like um, the cleanup they've got going on at the Pacific National Laboratories. Um, no, sorry, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, um, or the the Hanford Nuclear Site, as I grew up calling it. Um, they, in the 50s or 60s, in the development of, actually probably farther back, in the, going back to the 40s, and the development of, you know, part of the Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear power, um, for a while they just threw everything into into drums altogether, and uh, and buried it and hoped for the best. Um, more recently, they've been, you know sticking probes in to try to figure out what's in the drums and uh, whatever the mixture has turned into has gotten nasty enough that they, uh, they've they had probes corrode away to nothing before they can get a reading. Um, so they've got a, a big problem trying to, have had a big problem trying to figure out what's there and how they can deal with it now. Um, so in addition to creating an immediate safety hazard possibly, you've got a long-term issue of creating something that's going to be harder to deal with and harder to figure out how to deal with and maybe unsafe to handle. So it is important to keep track of what your waste is and where it's going. Um, generally, when you have somebody in to pick up your chemical waste, they want to know what it is and how much of, how much of each compound is, is there so they know how to deal with it. Um, talk very briefly about the scientific method. There's a, a nice little article on that. Um, basically, the scientific method is just a semi-formal method for you know, producing knowledge. You observe what's going on. You come up with a way to make a measurement based on what's going on. You experiment to see if you can alter what's going on. 
you come up with a hypothesis to see if you can ex to try to explain what you saw. You test that hypothesis somehow, usually through another experiment. You, mo you go back, you modify your hypothesis, you repeat over and over. And hopefully you learn something and get a little closer each time. Um, that's pretty much it for what I would like to cover in this first section. Um, if you have any questions, I can be available by email. Um, I will be in during the class sessions on Blackboard Collaborate and uh, look forward to working with you all this semester. Thank you. Bye.